All right, why don't we kick off? Hello, and thank you all for joining us. The Wall Street Blockchain Alliance is proud to offer this global webinar presented by our friends at WSBA member Blockchain Intelligence Group and Rug Pull Finder on the topic of NFTs, auditing, regulatory oversight, and risk, present and future. In this session, the Blockchain Intelligence Group team and the Rug Pull Finder teams will discuss the challenges and importance of NFT audits, the current state of regulations that impact the industry, investigations, trends in the future, and much more. Before we begin, as with all of our webinars, a bit of housekeeping for today's session. This webinar, keep in mind, is being recorded. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. Attendees are encouraged to submit questions for each session or for the panel, rather, using the Zoom chat function. Uh, and we will, of course, reserve time at the end of the event for audience Q&A. For everyone on this webinar, please keep in mind that this event is offered for general information and education purposes only. Uh, and is not intended to constitute investment, legal, tax, or accounting advice. Ken, as you know, I know a lot of lawyers. They helped me script that one. Uh, any views or opinions expressed during this event are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance or our participant firms. And with that, I want to stop talking and introduce a couple of old friends and colleagues. Uh, we're going to start off, I believe, let me stop this share with you. Mr. Goodwin, old friend, good to see you. I know you've got a bit of a presentation. Uh, why don't you kick off that presentation? Tell everyone who you are, who you're working with, and what Blockchain Intelligence Group is doing. Sure, sure. Ron, it's, it's a pleasure to present to the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. It's good to see uh, old names and good friends again. Uh, I, I see some very familiar names and, and, and people who I've spoke with on panels before. So I'm Ken Goodwin, uh, part of the Blockchain Intelligence Group, the Director of Regulatory Institutional Affairs. And I spend a lot of my days these days, other than traveling, but meeting with a lot of you guys actually on this list. Because uh, some of you, uh, the people who are at the event are here on the, online, have actually had some opportunities to do some demos, present the services that we offer at the Blockchain Intelligence Group. Other than that, doing a lot more speaking engagements uh, on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, speaking for FinTech TV, uh, and a big advocate of, of course, uh, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and digital assets. Uh, I, Ron, I will make a disclaimer today to the group today because I have to be very cautious that everything I do say uh, is not a representation of Mike and Marie Mansfield Foundation or the Aspen Institute or the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston as well as the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And the reason why I make that statement is because I am working on a project uh, with them um, uh, that will be announced uh, in first quarter of 2023. Uh, that's really influential in this space. Uh, so, Ron, do you, do you want me to go into the slides in reference to the time, or how do you want me to do this? I know you've got a presentation, then we'll follow up with Nick's uh, commentary and presentation after that. So if you want to share your presentation, speak to those points. Um, I will let you steer the ship, old friend. Sure, sure. That sounds good. Uh, just bear with me for a moment. I will switch over and... I should be ashamed. I do this all the time, actually, because I do teach uh, financial accounting. Uh, so the topic of this of today is non-fungible tokens, auditing, oversight, risk, present, and future. Uh, that's going to be our panel discussion. Uh, my respectful colleague Nick, he's he's pretty much the NFT expert uh, when it comes to this. I'm curious to know what he has to say and what he has to offer. Uh, in this space. I will say to you, I am not an attorney. Uh, I am not a lawyer, but I do have a lot of lawyer and attorney friends and, and have some opportunities to, to learn a lot in this space. Uh, this is me. I won't be too long. Uh, Ken Goodwin, Director of Regulatory Institutions and Affairs at the Blockchain Intelligence Group. Those who might not know me, I spent some time at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, about 10 years, uh, part of the Term Asset Back Liquidity Facility Program. I am the only Mike and Maureen Mansfield fellow of the Federal Reserve System. I'm also the Aspen Institute Knocker Sony Scholar. Uh, I, after the Fed, I spent some time on Wall Street working at the World Bank of Scotland, HSBC, Grant Thornton, PwC. Also created my company called Genesis Ventures, which delved in the, into the blockchain space. Uh, those who probably don't know, I've also curated events. Uh, curated the first women leaders in blockchain in New York City with uh, one in the likes of Christina Dolan, uh, who's a dear friend of mine, the first curator of the Urban Leaders in Blockchain, as well as the Bahamas in Blockchain, uh, the first curator of the Globally Local FinTech AI Blockchain Conferences. Uh, and from that, I learned a lot from my peers in this space. Now, I always like to start this way whenever I do presentations. And one of the lessons I've learned 
in speaking to a lot of the corporate CEOs and executives, uh, CCOs and CTOs in this space, and I've learned a lot from them, is that technology is definitely changing us. Uh, we're going to a digital transformation. And what inspired me to share this was a recent conversation that I had with one of the CCOs at a major institution, because that CCO challenged me and said, hey, look, you know, we understand the services that you offer, but how are you able to, to incorporate that and build out our infrastructure from a traditional finance component to a decentralized finance component? And I went back and I said, wow, this is a very comprehensive question that you asked me. So I went back and I looked back and I said, wow, you know, one of the things that really, that's really impactful within our space, the digital asset space and the blockchain space is data proliferation, the ability to extract data and information. Uh, that's very important because what that does is establish a way to create this, what they call this digital ID. Uh, and that's important because that leads into what I call platform, platformatization or platformization. The ability to take that information, use that information to for centralized processes or decentralized processes. So these are terminologies that you're really, really familiar with. Centralized pl platform versus a decentralized platform, which eventually leads us on to uh, substitution of products. And I say substitution of products because I'm referring to products such as non-fungible tokens, decentralized finance products, stablecoin products. So that being said, you know, blockchain application, we already know this very well, the distributed ledger technology is the technology that's driving us to create these new products. And if you take this different format or you take this format and you apply this across the table, you can apply this across any different technology. This format also sets the ground for setting policies and procedures uh, for reg regulatory control, uh, governance risk and controls that are set in place by regulators. You may ask yourself, and I ask myself all the time, what is an NFT? Uh, I, will say, I will share with you the first time I had the opportunity to learn about non-fungible tokens uh, was directly through a gentleman, and I will share his name, Mr. Igor Kamel. He was the first one that introduced me to this through his platform called Bank X. And essentially that platform was a platform that would actually target entertainers. Entertainers were not very popular but actually has some kind of image or some kind of record, and they're able to go on this platform and digitize that to get uh, liquidity. But typically, this pretty much this defini that definition is opened up for discussion, but this definition is constantly changing. Uh, Non-fungible non tokens represent digital assets, which can range from images to songs, to videos, to tweets, uh, that are verified through the blockchain technology. Uh, Owning NFTs allow individuals to claim exclusive ownerships over these digital assets. NFTs allow for a way to monetize digital goods by authenticating their scarcity and provenance. And we know that NFTs don't represent the actual asset itself, nor the IP, nor production or copyright, but solely a record of ownership. Now here's the key here, and I've always asked that question. If it doesn't represent the actual asset uh, and it only represents solely a record of ownership, that begs the question of what is actually an NFT and how do we classify that? Uh, and we'll talk about that later on and I move back to that, but we'll talk about the example that I have in place uh, where we go to a typical baseball game and you buy a ticket and that ticket is actually that record of ownership. Uh, and it doesn't say that you own the actual team itself. The team itself is an underlying asset, but it's the right to actually go to that game. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more further about what does that entails from a treatment, accounting treatment standpoint, from a tax treatment standpoint, and then from a regulatory standpoint. Some people may argue and they, they would say, well, you know, origins of NFTs are not crypto kitties. Uh, for me, I mean, speaking for myself, that was my first hooray in dealing with non-fungible tokens. It could be something else. I'm, I'm curious to hear. I'm open to hearing uh, what other people think. Uh, I'm sure there's other examples out there, uh, but my first experience with non-fungible tokens was through CryptoKitties. And that's when I realized, I said, this technology, or this, the product of this technology is gonna be substantial. Now, the biggest question I asked was, were these NFTs, were these NFTs creating a large percentage of fraud? Uh, from what I'm hearing, I think 70 to 90% of these NFTs could be fraudulent. Uh, that could be a challenge within the marketplace. 
some points to consider regarding NFTs. Uh, before I go along a little bit further, I want to thank Sean, uh, Professor Sean Smith for uh, hearing me out on this, actually. I took some time to reach out to Sean, and I said, Sean, you know what? I really, really you know, been involved in this space for quite so long, but I consider you to be the NFT expert when it comes down to uh, accounting and tax. And Sean and I had an opportunity to meet at the AICPA event and discuss and discuss this issue here. So the first thing that comes to mind is evaluation of NFT as an asset class. You know, traditionally when we evaluate any kind of asset class, we traditionally think of, of discounted cash flow models in place. So the idea of, of an NFT not really having cash flows is a big concern here. Now I thought about this a little bit deeply here and I said, boy, you know, what if that NFT actually has cash flow? And what I mean by that, meaning that in a, in a case of a ticket, you purchase a ticket and that ticket is your right to go to a stadium and now you establish a marketplace. You know, you purchase the ticket itself and then you resell the ticket back into the secondary market. So in that case, you are producing cash flow, but these are predictive cash flow. So there's an argument in terms of what is the proper approach to evaluate NFT as a cash flow. The other question is the uh, treatment as an income tax liability. You know, minted auctions, royalties. These are areas that the I'm sure the Internal Revenue Services is going to look at and tr to try to determine how you can treat uh, non-fungible tokens. Uh, and then, of course, we need to create a system to validate the NFTs. I mean, how do we know that these NFTs actually exist? Where do they come from? Uh, who is the actual producer, the issuer of these NFTs? How do we tie that into the underlying assets? Uh, one of the things that I gather in my research is that FASB has not mentioned that NFT would be considered as part of their research. And as a result, uh, our lovely friends at the Security Exchange Commission uh, could consider NFTs as Ethereum deemed securities. Uh, and, I, and I say this because uh, most recently the commissioner has mentioned the uh, Ethereum being uh, potentially classified uh, as a security. And I, if that's the case, then we're looking at the entire population of NFTs uh, that would be under that jurisdiction, actually, as a security. Uh, what's unique about this, and here's my experience in this space uh, working at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, and the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. I have not heard too much about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau on this. And I would hope and think that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau will come in and look at consumer compliance regulations in regards to disclaimers and disclosures. And, and these are very important in terms of establishing consumer protection laws. Uh, for those who may not know it, the CFPB was created out of the Dodd-Frank Act. But originally, your CFPB started off with the uh, regional banks and the Federal Reserves. So the Federal Reserves and the regional banks basically had uh, consumer compliance uh, examination functions that would actually go in and investigate large cap, uh, large, uh, small, medium sized tier one, tier two, tier three banks against the consumer, uh, consumer uh, the CRA Act which was very important for the Fed because in order for you to actually do any kind of M&A, you have to have at least a bubble four on the CIA uh, to actually proceed with that. Ken, so, if, if, if we could, just a quick question. You and I and, and Nick, we tend to make these conversational, but on your last slide, you mentioned, um, if we could go back to that, the SEC would consider NFTs as Ethereum and NFTs as potentially as securities. But if they're based on the Ethereum underlying level one, you say, or in and of themselves as securities? Uh, I would say, boy, I'm not gonna put my uh, word in, in Giza's okay. mouth. Uh, I, 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 would, I would say, and, and here's what, the way I took it. I, I took it as based on Ethereum. Okay. I know Ethereum. Um, so I, I think that he's really going in and he's got a broad scope uh, you know, again, you know, he's, you know, all due respect to the SEC, uh, their regu regulatory oversight uh, has been at, uh, at risk these days. So I think that he's really have to have a broad scope when it comes down to Ethereum. Thank you, Ken. So this brings up the point of one of the more uh, difficult uh, challenges. Today, I, I will not touch on uh, the full scope of the Uniform Commercial Codes. And that, that includes uh, controllable uh, electronic records, 
qualifying purchasers, teetering, uh, and, and, and other topics. Uh, generally, what I did here is I went back and I said, boy, uh, what really, what regulations uh, that I know and that I'm familiar with uh, that would actually cover potentially non-fringible tokens. And the UCC codes came to mind. And it came to mind because one, you're dealing with trade and you're dealing with commerce, but most importantly, you're dealing with electronic records. Uh, so I went into my research and I was very fortunate to uh, went to an event last, a couple of weeks ago, I actually with the New Hampshire Bankers Association and had the opportunity to watch someone present uh, on this subject matter. Uh, essentially, uh, basically, an electronic record in contrast to a paper record defines record as information that's inscribed on a tangible medium or that is stored in an electronic or medium and is retrievable in perceivable form. Uh, so it gets really complicated here, despite the word asset. But essentially what the, the New Hampshire's Bankers Association was basically doing was they were setting the precedence and changing some of these UCC codes uh, to discover and talk about digital assets and cryptocurrencies as well as non-fungible tokens. Um, some digital assets do, do themselves have value. Uh, Bitcoins and other virtual currencies may have values. Here's where we, we talk about non-fungible tokens. Electronic records in which other rights are evidenced under applicable law, a transferable record under the Uniform Electronic Transaction Act, evidence of payment right. So, these things are really, really significant in terms of establishing what the federal regulators will probably do. Um, and then I went into the scope uh, of the commercial law in relation to digital assets to deal with rights of private parties. Uh, the questions here, to what extent does a, part, a buyer of a digital asset take the asset free of third party property claims and consider virtual non-fiat currency? You know, how does a secure party perfect a security interest in digital assets and ensure that security interest has priority and enforce this security interest. So all these questions here, I'm sure the lawyers on this, on this, uh, on this call will look at this and they would look at each word and they would probably say, well, but, uh, and working with lawyers. But the great thing about this is that it's written out and that it's precedence for something else that may happen within the uh, non-fungible token space. This the proposed amendment, at least for New Hampshire, does not address other laws such as whether a digital asset is a security or commodity for regulatory purposes, taxations of a digital assets, uh, which most of the members here at the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance is very familiar with, money transmission laws, anti-money laundering laws. And this leads me to where we're at today uh, in this space. Uh, it, it's a smorgasbord as to where we're going at in reference to uh, non-fungible tokens. And, and I share this screen because Ron was the moderator of this event, this lovely event at AICPA. And we were trying to figure out what was going on with non-fungible tokens and how would that be treated from not just a tax perspective, but also regulatory oversight. Uh, what we gathered was that A, there's still room to be grown in this area, and B, uh, that this non-fungible token itself will have an impact on the blockchain system. Uh, I'm sure that my colleague, um, has more to say about that. So what I did was I took some time and I said, okay, where are we going at here next? Uh, and I'm going to run through this in terms of uh, regulators oversight. The Federal Reserve, uh, the Board of Governors are pretty much responsible for the Bank Holding Corporate Act uh, and payment systems. The Office of the Control of Currencies tend to look at charter banking and federal savings. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau we spend more time looking at consumer protection and disclosures. Uh, we mentioned that earlier. The Commodities and Future Trading Commission, I'm very curious to know what they would have to say about non-fungible tokens. Uh, maybe under one of the Commodity Exchange Acts, I'm curious whether or not that will fall under Title VII, Title VIII, or Title IX. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, you hear from my colleague, he'll speak a little bit more in-depthly about that in terms of the impact to anti-money laundering, Bank Secrecy Act, Office of Foreign Assets and Control, OFAC, in terms of sanctions and programs and trade embargoes. The Internal Revenue Services, uh, of course, they're gonna look at this from a tax perspective in terms of uh, looking at this as a way of a property and they tax this as a property. Uh, but I'm sure the Internal Revenue Services has will have a say 
as to what will happen with non-fungible tokens. The Security Exchange Commission, as I mentioned earlier, uh, may look at this from the standpoint of taking the grounds of Ethereum and saying that Ethereum is a security as one avenue of this. The other avenue of this run, it could be that the Security Exchange Commission say, hey, look, we're creating a market making uh, opportunity and thereby we're creating price and thereby we make creating uh, a, an opportunity for market manipulation and so forth. So they're going to look at this from an investor protection standpoint and fair markets. And that is all in terms of my presentation. I am going to stop sharing here and I'm going to pass this over to Nick. But before that, it, it seems like, Ron, I think because we are known for being interactive, I'm, yeah. I'm curious to know if there's a question here. Uh, I, I wanted to throw out a question. And again, for the for the folks in the audience, uh, please submit your questions in the q and I'd love to hear them. Um, a couple of things, Ken and, and Nick, certainly feel free to, to chime in. Uh, recently, we we saw the White House launch its comprehensive framework, quote unquote, um, a little bit of a selfless plug, selfish plug here. The WSBA is holding a webinar on this next week. Um, but I would love, Ken, your thoughts and, and Nick's thoughts um, in the context of what you're talking about, this kind of landscape of legislation and, and regulators. Are you concerned about the tone and tempo of that framework? Um, and I think one other thing I'd like to throw out there for consideration is, is the potential landscape for case law as it impacts NFTs, for example. And maybe it's a little bit of a stretch, but the ripple case against the, uh, with the SEC still goes on. There are multiple cases. Nick or Ken, do you have any comments on that? Or, or what would attendees need to view down the road in, in that context? Yeah, uh, I'm going to start off first, actually, because most of my colleagues and friends are down in D.C. Uh, sitting around with Congress and, and really trying to lobby and learn more about the process itself. Uh, as you probably know, Ron, there's, there's, there's two different bills. You have the Statement on Bill. You have the bill that's also being done by Gillibrand and Loomis. Uh, and those two different bills, even though I, I think they actually are two different bills. Uh, I, I like Statement on Bill because I think that Statement on Bill is deal more with the payment system. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of spoiled by this coming from the Federal Reserve and working with the Treasury. So I always defer back to the white paper as a digitized payment system. And the last time I heard that the anytime you deal with payment system, you deal with the Fed and the Treasury. Uh, on the other hand, you look at what's happening with Gillibrand and Loomis. What's interesting about that is that you do have FERC that's involved in that, the Federal Energy Water Commission. Uh, and the last time I dealt with FERC was when I was at RBS and we had to sell off uh, an asset, one of our energy trading asset, uh, to J.P. Morgan Chase. So anytime when you sell off both the tangible and intangible asset, you have to report that to FERC. And FERC is multiple states, uh, multiple FERCs throughout the U.S. To answer your question, uh, remember, this is about research. Uh, so the administration said that every agency needs to start to do research. And one of the great thing about it is that the administration didn't, it wasn't clear, it didn't set policy yet. So what Nick is doing actually, and the irony behind this, the lesson I learned about creating policy is that you need to have examples. If you don't have examples, you can't create policy. And, and, and it looks like Ken froze. Nick, Ken, I'm sorry, it looks like you got cut off, but Nick, did you want to add to that? And I, I don't want to minimize for the audience, you and I know, and Ken knows, that there's a, a vast array of different regulations being put forward, different proposals, a lot of legislation, kind of messy, and there's this perspective that nothing's going to happen stateside, at least, um, with this current, until this current election cycle is over. But your thoughts there, and why don't we launch right into your presentation, if we could. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. Um, so in terms of, I mean, the White House paper, I think a lot of people are concerned that it is kind of an overstep. But to Ken's point, I think it, it truly is focused more on just better understanding the market, giving all these agencies an opportunity to kind of catch up before policies were to be set in stone, right? Um, but I think one of the most important points to highlight, and, and I kind of agree with Ken here, is one of the biggest struggles right now in the space, um, specifically with NFTs, is the notion of consumer protection, hmm. right? It's kind of on every individual within that's trading NFTs or participating within the market to, you know, to protect themselves, you know? Um, and I, I think, you know, the way that Biden approached it within the White House guidance, I think, you know, lends credibility to a board like the CFPB coming in and, and being able to play a deeper role, role within the space. But I mean, overall, I think, you know, nobody's shy about knowing that we need regulation. 
yeah. you know, obviously looking at crypto, it, it's it's this weird conundrum, right? But I, you know, I look at it as definitely more of a positive for sure than anything else. I, I don't look at it though as a comprehensive framework. You've probably heard me say, complain about that several times, but yeah. we'll, we'll see where that goes. Nick, I know you got a lot of great information as well. I'll work with the team to see if we can get Ken back for wrap up and questions. Uh, if yeah. you want to kick off your presentations for the audience, and again, for everyone in the audience, if you've got Q&A, put them in the Q&A chat. Nick and Ken and I will go through them uh, five to 10 minutes before the end. Uh, but Nick, over to you, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess just for a formal introduction for everybody, uh, my name is Nick Hornacek. So I am the CEO of Rugpool Finder. Um, Rugpool Finder is a digital um, digital asset risk management and cybersecurity firm. And we're really dedicated to eradicating you know, all the threats that pose harm to the mass adoption of blockchain technology. Um, so at this point, um, you know, really what that comes down to is working every single day to increase trust, transparency, and the safety and safety of the Web3 space, right? By identifying and reporting fraud, um, providing up-to-date information on emerging threats within the space, um, and then developing innovative solutions to assist entities in just safely navigating the blockchain. You know, so we maintain a very robust data set when it comes to the notion of different rug pools. Um, we also are doing a lot of work right now on the on the KYC and the KYB side to provide better mechanisms to audit and, you know, kind of meet what the future guidance is going to say when it comes to launching your own protocols and everything like that. But let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is really more of the state of the current market that we're seeing from a fraud and financial crime perspective, discuss some of the trends that we've seen across rug pools, um, and other types of fraud, and then dive definitely into what I see as, let's say, what NFTs look like whenever we reach mass adoption. You know, what needs to change? What's going to be different? Um, and I think you know what Ken had shared, you know, fits in really well with with kind of where I want to take this. Which, you know, but let's just kind of set the scene at first. You know, when we think about you know NFTs today. You know, again, I, I hit this point home all the time is, you know, fraud and financial crime truly right now is the biggest obstacle to mass adoption. And a lot of that really does come down to consumer education. Um, my company, my firm, Rugpool Finder, actually ran a study um, within the NFT market. We had about 10,000 respondents back in March, and we discovered that 94% of respondents to that survey are a victim of some sort of scam within NFTs within their first three investments. Or within their first three purchases that could be clicking on a phishing link you know buying into a, an extremely overhyped project whatever the case might be but to this day you know as of you know i think um might have been it was either chain analysis i think reported last year there's 2.8 billion dollars worth of scams specifically related to rug pools and i'll definitely define that for you guys here shortly um, but just this year alone, we um, my firm rug pool finders already reported over 550 of these similar scams resulting in over $3.2 billion taken out of the market. You know, so when we look at, you know, the, the CAGR that's expected to, you know, be implemented over the course, you know, two years in terms of market growth, we're looking at, you know, 300, 400X the amount of users currently, you know, so being able to put in place smart regulations, being able to create the right policies, procedures, and controls when it comes to launching these projects and having better accountability mechanisms is absolutely going to be necessary for us to truly advance them, advance the space. What's going on, Ron? Nick, just a quick question, if I could, on this slide. Uh, one of the things that we found interesting, we've been tracking volumes across different asset classes, like I'm sure you have and other members have. And with the kind of crypto winter, we've watched the peak of NFT volume and price kind of, kind of plummet. Were you surprised by the amount of scams so far for NFTs in 2022? Was the, these Were these data points kind of surprising based on your research? Well, it's, it's actually kind of fascinating. If you were you know, looking at the NFT space back in October, November, December, really whenever the bull market was truly starting to take off within the NFT space, you know, I felt like because of how emerging of a market it was, I was really expecting you know, a, a, a lot more an increased amount of scams, specifically within like the January, February period. You know, and we kind of reached a point within the market where you know, March through May, and maybe this is part of the reason for the bear market. Maybe it's not. It probably isn't. Let's be honest. But you know, I I was calculating you know ninety to ninety five percent of projects in May were actually direct scams, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it be fake mints, um, phishing attempts, um, spoofing, whether it be an actual rug pull where they're over promising, under delivering. Um, so it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. 
But let's go ahead and we'll just define some terms and kind of talk through um, you know, some of the biggest challenges that are existing right now, you know, so obviously the biggest notion right now is a rug pull. I think ever, most people on this call are, are familiar with the term at this point, but it essentially stems from, you know, you're attracting an investor into an NFT project or into any crypto project, and you're essentially pulling the rug out from under them or failing to deliver on the promises that you made, you know, so in today's day and age, the majority, you know, the vast majority, over 95% of every single NFT project is kind of using launching an NFT as a fundraise to then go and deliver some sort of business strategy. Um, and usually how we've kind of been seeing this come, come to fruition is there's really two different notions. So there's what I would say is a hard rug pull where you know they actually have no intention of delivering, but it's all just based on marketing and creating hype and getting people to invest their funds. And then they pull out the rug within you know a day or a couple of days or a week of of that minting event, right? Where it starts to become a little strange now is now that we've started to see you know law enforcement really prioritizing coming after these these scammers and, and these the, these different threat actors. They've started to change the way that they orchestrate these types of rug pulls where. You know, and I'll go over an example later on, but I call this like the notion of a soft rug pull or a slow rug pull, where they'll launch a project, you know, and they'll make it appear like they're being active for a period of, you know, one month to three months, even as far as six months, you know, and there's still some solo rugs out there that are still operating today, you know, but essentially, you know, it's the, the same end goal, right? Drink, getting as many, as much royalties out of the market as possible, getting as much, as many you know, new investors into it. You know, and still with no intention of actually delivering on any sort of strategy. Now, rug pulls right now, I, I personally estimate that that's really only about 45 to 50% of all of the scams in the space, um, specifically within NFTs. All of the rest result from traditional like web two problems. One of the most common ones is obviously like your classic phishing attempts, right? Where they're really just exploiting weaknesses in human psychology, right? So they're creating some sort of fear mechanism, some sort of urgency or curiosity to click on a link. And what happens when you click on that link, it essentially is, you know, providing access to your crypto wallet where, you know, all of your NFTs and all of your crypto would then be drained. Um, I think last year, the FTC reported, um, they had said over a billion dollars in, in assets that were reported to them being stolen. And 600, I think it was uh, 600,000 of that came directly from phishing or 600 million, excuse me, came directly from phishing attempts. Where it starts to become a little murky right now is, you know, we have these really large collections that have done some really great work like Board Ape Yacht Club, CryptoPunks, um, Doodles, where they've been able to go and, you know, turn this NFT project into a, you know, a $4 billion valuation or an $800 million valuation in the case of Doodles. We started to see spoofing start become a much deeper challenge where essentially, you know, I don't know if you guys know, but within the NFT space today, most systems that are being used are very web two centric systems. So like Twitter, for instance, is the most popular platform being used to promote and discuss crypto projects, right? And as we all know, as we saw within within the Senate hearing last week, you know, Twitter does not necessarily have the best approach when it comes to cybersecurity and safety of its users. You know, so we've been seeing a lot of very simple interactions where, you know, low quality Twitter accounts are spoofing or completely mimicking some of these big projects. You know, so for instance, there was one that actually just happened yesterday. Um, it actually stole over two hundred thousand dollars worth of assets, and all they did was they copied the entire Doodles Twitter account. And as everybody started to think it was the real Doodles, they then posted a, a fake a fake phishing link, which then was able to steal over two hundred thousand dollars worth of assets. So it's kind of interesting, right? But it's still kind of not not necessarily the most sophisticated type of attack. Nick, if I could just add one question to this, because I think it's really important for the audience as well. Uh, two things real quickly. Um, from the spoofing perspective, what we've seen, and I, I want to get your perspective on this, the ability to spoof and really look legitimate is increasing. Um, you know, it used to be back in the day, we'd see a bad email that it was mistyped. It had a whole bunch of weird stuff that was was kind of phishing and spoofing. But the, the ability to professionalize is getting better which means for investors and participants, it's getting worse. You have to be more careful. Would you agree with that? 
I would agree wholeheartedly. And I think, you know, one of the challenges right now is you know, there's some, some um, DNS domain name service providers that have actually allowed you to create a web, a website that can use English characters or Romanized characters, as well as Cyrillic characters. Well, a Cyrillic I looks a heck of a lot like uh, lowercase L in, in English, right? You know, so those little intricacies can't really be detected by the human eye at all, though, you know, that's that's exactly how they kind of hide the, those types of malicious links, malicious actions. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Yeah, most definitely. Um, one of the most concerning that I think I've seen over the course of the last, really the last month or two, really as the, as the bear market's kind of taken off, is this whole notion of social engineering. Um, and for those that really don't know what social engineering is, right, it's gaining trust of somebody over a, a period of time where you have the intention to commit some sort of fraud against that person. Um, we actually have an active case right now. This is this is a pretty interesting story, but I don't want to spend too much time talking into it. Um, there was a woman um, from the UK. She actually sold, she exited her, her startup for a couple hundred million dollars. And she decided to take 10% of what she earned and convert it into crypto and launch her own VC fund. Um, and she was actually talking to the first company that they were that was pitching to them. She flew out to Spain, to Madrid, and she was meeting them at this restaurant. And as she's talking to them, they asked her to prove that she has these assets available. So she gets on her trust wallet on her phone. She signs in at the table, shows them that she has 19, 20 million dollars plus in crypto. Well, that entire thing was this. They talked for about two, two weeks, three weeks before they met. It was an entire orchestrated event where you know, they had actually taken the cameras in the restaurant, pointing them directly on her chair, anticipating this action the entire time. You know, but they kind of spent that, you know, the, the two, three week period gaining her trust and, and proving what they were trying to do. Right. Right now, we're kind of seeing it with job offer scams. I don't know if you guys saw, you know, Coinbase. There was um, an executive at Coinbase that was recently, you know, offered some sort of job over the course of two months of interviews, clicked on a link and ended up stealing all of his assets. So it's nothing like. It's, it's a weird conundrum just because, you know, with the whole notion of pseudo anonymity within the crypto space to begin with. You know, it's very easy to get caught up if you're not talking to people ever over voice or, or, you know, not necessarily having the right, your own personal risk management strategy to stay safe, right? Um, but 90% of the time, these social engineering engineering attacks are a little less sophisticated than what I just explained. Um, right now, you know, all the most influential people within the NFT space are you know, 20 to 25 years old, they have a couple hundred thousand followers, they're just buying and trading NFTs, not thinking too much about it, not thinking too much about their safety. And we've seen four or five notable accounts within the NFT space just within the last month that each have over 100,000 followers, have their accounts compromised. And when their accounts are compromised, all that's happening is they're saying, hey, I've decided to launch my own project, check it out, click this link. And then all 100,000 of their followers are then susceptible to a deeper level attack as well. But let me uh, show, I have uh, about three or four examples actually leveraging blockchain intelligence groups um, platform. You know, to, for me and my organization, I don't think we could probably do what we do without their platform just because they also have NFT, the ability to look at NFTs directly integrated into a single chart. So it just kind of helps streamline things. But let me talk through one interesting example. You know, I talk about, you know, Twitter a lot whenever it comes to NFT investigations, but, you know, probably just as bad from a cybersecurity standpoint is the notion of Discord. You know, so for instance, my team in my Discord community, we have a, we have a team of 25. 10 of those people are purely moderators, but those moderators are getting requests every single day to look at projects, to go check out X, Y, and Z server. And, all it takes is one malicious link being sent to that mod to that moderator to not be thinking clearly to then click on that link to then compromise their account. That moderator or that person that compromised their account would then have access to the back end of any Discord server. You know, so one of the most notorious ones we're seeing um, is by it's a spoof spoof attack regarding Trait Sniper. For those that know don't know what Trait Sniper is, it's essentially a purchasing bot for NFTs where it helps you figure out where the highest value NFTs exist at the lowest floor price. And all this was, you know, it was a collaboration manager usually ends up getting their account compromised. They then use that admin control to post a fake trade sniper 
website into that Discord community, into the announcement section, which pings every single member in that community. You know, and across these, this trait sniper hack specifically, it's all being actually orchestrated by a network of about 20 different wallets that has so far compromised over 200,000 wallets in 2022. Um, I can walk through the slide here, and I hope you guys can see my, uh, my mouse as I come over the slide. Give me one second here. Oh. So essentially what we have here, all right, is this is the victim's wallet. There was an interaction between this wallet, this wallet, and this wallet, all within the same five minutes. So essentially what happened was this, this guy's account was compromised by clicking on that link. He provided access to this wallet here, which was the, the hacker, right? They provided access to that scammer to have access to their funds. The second they gave that access, this wallet transferred in funds to be able to cover the transfer out of all of their NFTs. So every single purple line here is a specific NFT that was taken from their wallet. The project was, I think, apes together strong for this victim, but you know, I've seen you know probably 500 different projects have their NFTs stolen from holders purely by this hack. And then what's interesting here is you know you can kind of see the flow of funds. And I know it doesn't look like a lot. I didn't pull up all the transactions because it's super messy if I do that. But just to clean it up for you guys and make it easy, you know, you can see a very clear flow of funds to a middle wallet, then eventually leading to this wallet over here. What's interesting about this is this wallet was one of the main fund receivers of the Aletheia exploit, which was a very notable crypto scam that happened back in 2019, early 2020. You know, so it, it it's just fascinating to me that a lot of these current scams that are happening are the same orchestrators of the, sc the scams that were happening, you know, three, four, five years ago even, but they're now just applying it to a new emerging market within crypto. Nick, on that point, if I could real quickly, you and I, we all know that a lot of these wallet addresses are showing up on the OFAC sanctions list. Are, to the extent you could speak to it, are, are wallets that are engaged in this kind of social engineering and phishing uh, for NFTs, are, to your knowledge, are they on the OFAC list as well or not yet? Not many of them. There are a few. Um, I would say less than 200, honestly, maybe even less than 100. Um, versus, you know, for instance, my organization right now, we maintain a database of over 40,000 wallets. Um, you know, and blockchain intelligence group probably has a much bigger database than that of, of wallets that are directly connected to financial crime. I think they're you know, without there being the regulatory pressure on that side for a lot of these different exchanges, especially if they're not like centralized. I think you know a lot of this kind of falls through the cracks right now in the current state of the industry. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Absolutely. Um, now let's talk about rug pulls because rug pulls just seem more exciting for people to talk about just because, you know, it usually results in creating a lot of marketing buzz and hype around a specific project. Um, one of the, probably one of actually the, the first rug pull that we ever reported and kind of the reason why we started our company was a project called Ancient Cats Club, which was supposed to be the first 4K definition 3D NFT project using cats that look like ancient Egyptian gods. Um, this project launched in, I think it was the last week in November, first week of December. Um, you can see that actually right here on, on the slide, right? Um, what's interesting though is, and what we've tended to see with all of these different rug pull attempts is once you're successful at one, you tend to gain a following and then it makes it that much easier to do your second, third, fourth, once you kind of crack the market when it comes to, to marketing and, and gaining hype, right? Um, so this one, Board Bunny, is, is a little fascinating because it's actually a slow rug pull. They're technically still operational today, technically. Um, and I'll explain why I say that. But prior to them launching their project, they were actually directly responsible for eight other previous rug pulls. And that's all verifiable using any sort of blockchain technology solution or even going on EtherScan and, and manually tracking wallets. Yeah, so about a month before they minted, we were actually... You know, we actually figured out that you know this whole project was going to be a scam. Board Bunny launched at a mint price, I believe it was 0.2 or 0.3 Ethereum at the, at the time. That would have been about fifteen hundred dollars. Within a week of mint, you know they sold out instantly. Even though we were raising the alarms, there were others in the space like Zach XBT raising the alarms. They sold out instantly. Um, two weeks after mint, they actually had a floor price above two Ethereum. What's fascinating is they were you know 
talking about creating a game, talking about going into the metaverse, talking about all these inner life activations and events and et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on when we think about their roadmap. Three months in, now we're looking at like the end of March, they had still yet to deliver anything, but looking at the fund movement, you know, every all the purple is internal transactions directly out of the contract. The blue is flow of funds into, um, this right here is actually converting it back into USDC. Um, which was then withdrawn through um, a Binance hot wallet. Um, there's actually additional funds here that were withdrawn out through Binance, interestingly enough. But um, in March, there was zero, very clearly, you can see there was no money left in, in the contract, no money left in any of the wallets connected to any of the founders. Um, and they had yet to deliver any component of their wall, their roadmap. As everybody probably on this call saw um, in late March was the arrest of Frosties, um, the founders of Frosties. The day after that happened, the original founder of the project ended up coming back online, you know, making it seem like they were still here building and they were still delivering on their roadmap and had intentions of not being a scam. Um, that next day they launched merchandise to all of their holders and all of their holders could pay $40 plus shipping to be able to get access to one of these t-shirts. Um, which I think is also a, a whole nother topic of discussion, right? Since they just raised over $35 million from all of their holders, they're then now going to charge $40 more for a t-shirt. It's a whole nother topic of discussion. But I, these kind of cases are really interesting though, because it really does play on, you know, the human emotion. If I am invested in a particular asset, I want that asset to be successful. And I will preach to the world, no matter how messed up it looks on the surface, that it's safe, that it's secure, that they're doing the right thing, that my asset's going to eventually make money. You know, so that side, that human psychology, you know, creates kind of a conundrum on in from a um, let's say even say like a law enforcement side from enforcing it because when they talk to some of the victims, they they don't believe that they're still victims, even though you know it's very clear they had you know a twelve pointed roadmap and very clearly have not delivered on any of those. Um, Floyd Mayweather um, was actually a rarely notable promoter. Floyd Mayweather has been involved in promoting a slew of different types of scams across the space. I think he's he's been investigated by a couple of different agencies for that. Um, Jerry Judy, actually, he, I think his this is kind of interesting. His Twitter profile still is a board bunny. Um, and it was, you know, you can actually connect his wallet on this chart here. I, I don't know which wallet it is exactly. I'm pretty sure it's this one right here in the middle because I put it there for a reason. But uh you know, a lot of these are just paying these promoters anywhere from, you know, 50000 to $200,000, just the hype of the project, you know, and having that type of validation from influencers, having that validation from, from the market on, on the high floor price, you know, kind of pulls the wool over a lot of people's eyes, you know, which makes it a lot more difficult to investigate these. But, you know, one of the biggest rug pull examples I think of is, you know, if they launched what were very clearly previous scams, and then use the money from those previous scams to launch a new project. I think regardless of how successful that project ends up becoming, you know, it's still tied to the proceeds of financial crime, right? I'll talk about a little, it's a simpler case here as well, but it's an, it's an interesting one. I know this graph looks out of this world and I really didn't want it to kind of look out of this world. Um, this is actually a group on Twitter where they've never truly launched a real NFT project. Um, they're coined the rug pool mafia. And essentially what they've done over the course of February up until about April or May, whenever Twitter actually shut down all 200 of their Twitter accounts. It was a group of six people in Estonia that were creating and then subs subsequently um, gaining followers across all of these accounts. They were all inflated with like fake follower numbers. But when you have somebody that is a verified account that has over 100,000 followers and is talking about an NFT project, that's a buying signal for a lot of different people. So they ended up creating over 150 different NFT projects. So if we look at this chart, every single red dot that you see is a different NFT project that was launched. None of these NFT projects sold out. Um, most of them would gain on average about $126,000. Um, you know, with the intention, if they would have sold out, it would have cleared over a million dollars. Um, but again, all, all this was a result of was using social media to create this fake sense of hope or fake sense of hype, right? And collectively across all 150 of these projects, they were able to gain over $27 million. Um, I think, you know, this whole notion of 
you know, fear of missing out. And then, you know, really this pump and dump cycle that currently exists in the state of the NFT space just kind of further feeds into examples like this where, you know, I mean, if you guys look at the wallet chart, you can kind of see, you know, all the funds eventually lead back here to the central wallet, which again, it's actually another centralized exchange. Um, you know, I think there's still kind of an active investigation here. So I don't want to talk about like who or who is responsible or who can, who, what can be done to impact it. But just know that this, like, when I talk about the challenges of rug pulls in this space, and when I, when I preach that, you know, right now, 70% to 90% of projects are direct scams, it makes it very difficult to look at the future of NFTs and, and kind of see, see hope there. But, you know, me personally, I, I truly believe in the power of non-fungible tokens from, you know, to Ken's point, not just being, you know, these, art-based projects with roadmaps that are trying to crowdfund a business strategy. I really see them being more of, again, just a system of record, a better way to keep track of public or private information. Um, so I do wanna spend probably the last, I think what we got here, the last five minutes talking through just like what I see in terms of the future of the market. You know, I think, you know, we're gonna see PFPs the profile picture-based NFT projects lose steam. You know, right now, about 95% of the current market is all these art-based PFPs. But, you know, to my point, I really see, you know, every type of public record being stored on the blockchain through NFTs. So my company, Rugpull Finder, we actually just launched the first identity solution on chain that's using non-transferable or soul-bound NFTs to be able to cryptographically store identity information on chain without actually having that identity information on chain. Um, Ken brought up Starbucks, I believe, right? So I don't know if you guys know this, but Starbucks just launched a loyalty program where essentially it's just an NFT that's going to be able to store the amount of points that you're gaining by, by swiping your card at Starbucks. You know, really simple. I think the first mortgage was, was on chain, um, was minted on chain three months ago. You know, so even when you think about healthcare or your social security card or your driver's license, all of that information has the ability to be stored on chain through an NFT. Um, when I think about where we need to go as a space to... to to really achieve mass adoption, I think it's three pillared. Um, the first one I think is the most important right now is consumer education um, and consumer protection as well. You know, so we need to be able to create safer and easier ways to be able to access these assets and to be able to onboard somebody into this space. You know, I I cannot see my grandma right now in the state of the market. You know, getting involved in this space with how risky it is. You know, just because even though they're very simple types of scams and, and hacks that are happening, you know, there's not much in the way of individual user safety, except at like the centralized exchange, right? So I think we definitely need to have, you know, smarter centralized products, but also safer decentralized solutions to kind of hit that home. From a, a reg tech and cybersecurity standpoint, I, I really truthfully believe that, you know, there's really kind of no standard in place right now for how data sharing kind of happens, especially when we look at like traditional finance. You know, I, I really come from the AML KYC side of the world um, in traditional banking, you know, and having one bank be able to share information with another bank is, is a huge headache, right? And I think what's nice about NFTs and just crypto in general is the notion of being able to have these, you know, intuitive data sharing mechanisms that, that allow better reporting, um, better cross collaboration. And I think the more that we can all embrace that as an industry, the more we can move that forward. I also think that, you know, there is a lot of different native web three companies that are, that are trying to address these challenges. You know, I know we're taking on the identity and the investigation side. There's a lot of companies working on smarter, like wallet based solutions to, to be able to, you know, proactively look at a transit or I, I guess it would be proactively um, simulate a transaction before you actually, you know, trigger a wallet action, you know, so there's a lot of different things that we can do here. Um, and then obviously there's the whole notion of, you know, smart contract auditing, you know, having reputable firms look over this, um, learning, learning how to just be more apt to user safety. Like, I mean, that's really where it comes down to in my mind. Like it's what can we do in the short term to create the right mechanisms to drive forward that adoption. And I, I think like there has to be just better standards in place, especially from, you know, a creator side, a project accountability side, better audits, better KYC, better consumer safety standards. But let me wrap up there. 
I know that was a little long, more long winded than I than I anticipated being. So I apologize. Yeah. for that. No, Nick, that was that was absolutely great. We've got some q and I want to run by all of you. And Ken, if you could join us and come back, that'd be great. Some of the Q&A applies to you. Some great questions. Uh, so let's let's just kick off with this first one uh, from Jonathan uh, with the DOJ bringing actions against developers behind rug pull projects. Uh, which have, and to Nick, to some of the points and data that, and, that you've been showing are clear cut frauds. What do you see happening for those close calls where projects fail like any other business? They just couldn't get it off the ground versus actual fraud cases. And what are your what are your thoughts about that? I think that is one of the most polarizing questions to ask, um, because, I mean, realistically, when you look at any sort of business, there is the notion of a failed business venture. And I think every single law enforcement agency, any single exchange is, is struggling to properly identify what that means in the context of regulation. Um, for me, I really look at, I think the defining metric is really around malicious intent. You know, so were they, you know, every single time they were communicating, were they actually doing what they say they were trying to do? And it just failed out of inexperience or whatever the reason might be versus having a very clear malicious intent to obfuscate what they were doing. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, Ken, anything you want to add to that? We've got two or three other questions left, but only a couple of minutes. Yeah, no, I actually agree with him. I, I would I would take the same approach too. the, the intent and, and the actual source. I always think of the, the underlying asset, you know, the issuer themselves. I mean, is it being stolen from that particular issuer? So when I think of all these artists that have made a product, uh, an artwork, and how those artists may have those artwork being stolen, uh, you know, is it coming from the original source of that artist or that entertainer? So always, he's right. The, the intent is is very clear. In fact, most of your regulations are done with the regulatory intent in place. So I agree with Nick 100%. Thank you. Thank you both. So Cindy posted a question. It's really interesting. I think you both alluded to kind of use cases. So in your opinion, what are some of the most promising of the NFT use cases? GameFi, IP, arts? Uh, property rights. And I think the three of us know that this kind of NFT conversation is morphing into a digital assets and physical assets represented on a digital record. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And what are the kind of impacts that potential pending regulations might have in the future? Wait, I'm going to let you take that one, Nick. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of, in terms of the different... I have some thoughts on that one too, actually. You know, it's beautiful. That's a, if I can chime in this on, on, on a moment. I was thinking of in terms of, let's say, Campbell Soup. And if you think about Campbell Soup, and you think about Andy Warhol and how those two play together. So you have a corporation that actually has a brand that has value. And then you have Andy Warhol with also the painting that has value and how those two intertwine together. So it was, it was kind of that kind of question ran into that thought process. Uh, but I want to let Nick uh, play with this, and I may just chime in after Nick. <laughs> uh, well, I'd be curious on your take, Ken, from a regulation standpoint. After I discuss what I want, what I what I think I see is like some of the most prolific use cases. You know, in 2022, I'd say the biggest growth one right now has been within within GameFi. You know, which is creating a you know taking like a Fortnite marketplace and being able to resell your earnings. You know, from the hours that you dedicate to the game. I think. You know, when we look at the Minecraft ecosystem, when we look at any of these games, you know, that is a very great way to create more users and more engaged users to you know, actually see some sort of incentive. You know, so there was actually a game that released in March um, called Undead Blocks, where you know, if you're in if you're in a country where the average person is earning less than four dollars a day, you can feed your entire family off of playing this game all day. You know, that's that's pretty fascinating to learn. Um, yeah. but from a, I was just gonna, real quick. I was just going to say, from like a more mature type of of um, use case, I, I really see you know even like things like healthcare. You know, we all know that healthcare systems today are super slow and, and bogged down. You know, creating a safe, smart, decentralized manner to access those assets, I think, is where the NFT space is going to go over the course of the next four or five years. Nick, Ken, thank you both. We've got a bunch of other questions we're not going to be able to get to. We'll try to reply to them in writing and share them both with you, Ken and Nick. Uh, Ken, if people wanted to find out about you and Blockchain Intelligence Group, where should they go? Sure, sure. You can definitely go. We have a beautiful LinkedIn page uh, that and I actually just shared from that LinkedIn page uh, the NFT that was announced today by Starbucks. You can also reach me out directly to kenneth.goodwin at blockchaingroup.io. And you can also look on our webpage. Ken, thanks so much. Nick, tell us about Rockpool Finder. When can, where can people reach you? 
Absolutely. So best place would be through our website, rugpoolfinder.io, or to follow us on Twitter. Um, you can also reach out to me personally on LinkedIn. Gents, thank you so much. Great presentation as always, which kicked off an entire series of new conversations. We'll probably have to do this again really, really soon. Uh, for all of the attendees, thank you for joining us. We'll make the recording available as quickly as we can. We'll end it there. Nick and Ken, it's never enough time. Looking forward to catching up again soon. Thank, thank you so much. You guys, bye-bye. Bye-bye.